for those who become addicted to it. Addicted to the things of this world, it is a curse. Illa dhikrullah, except for the remembrance of Allah. To be addicted to the remembrance of Allah should be the desire of every Muslim. And whatever will help us to remember Allah. And the teacher, the scholar, and the student. So only that relationship, the teacher, scholar, and student, that is the blessed relationship in this life. So one may say, but I like business. I like to be a business person. Where do I fit in? Prophet Muhammad said, At tujjar humul fujjar. The traders, the business people are corrupt. But they were needed. <laughs> they needed. We need to have business people to do business. But know that the business profession which is about making profits. It's not about serving people, serving society, benefiting society. It's about making profits. That's my focus, that's my priority. Know that that is an evil way of life. Because when your goal is just to make profits, then you will lie. So you find that the traders in the trading place, they want to sell you something, they'll say, Wallahi, this is the best. And they know full well it is not the best. Wallahi, swearing by Allah, it is the best. So it's common amongst them, common. It is rare amongst them, the business person who is fearing Allah. But this is what Islam will produce if people accept Islam. If they are first students who have learned Islam, as the Prophet had said, Talab al ilmi farid ala kulli Muslim, seeking knowledge is compulsory for every Muslim. If that is a principle in their lives, then having sought that knowledge, knowledge of Allah, knowledge of Islam, knowledge of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if a person has made that their way of life, then the business they do will be guided by it. And they will be different from the other people who are in the business field. They will stand out amongst them. How traders brought Islam to West Africa. They didn't do it by trading like all the other traders did. You know that. It wasn't brought here by the sword. Yes, there were Fulani jihads and all this stuff, but things took place. That's different. But the spread of Islam was not by the sword. It was spread by traders. So how did traders spread Islam? You think it was them saying, you know, Allah is one and stealing your money? <laughs> no, it's not going to convince anybody. Obviously, they were treating the people honestly with their trade. They were telling the people when there were defects in the products that they were selling. Before Islam came to them, they were still trading. But they traded like everybody else traded. How did everybody else trade? You're trying to get over on somebody. The best way to make profits is what? You sell an inferior product and you get superior price. If there's something wrong with your product, you hide it in such a way that they don't know till after they bought it and you've left. Oh, look at this. You cheated them. But you made your money. That was the way of the traders. Built-in obsolescence is what they call it today. 
they build cars. This is well known. They build cars and they give you a five year warranty. You ever wondered why it's only five years? Why not a 10 year warranty or 20 year warranty? They just give you five years. Why? Because they have put parts in the car which are made from inferior metals and plastics. And they have tested them carefully. And they know that after five years of use, they're going to break down and you have to go and buy this part. And in reality, they will tell you, if you take a car apart, take off the wheels, take off everything, the doors, everything, and you sell it separately, it's worth three or four times the price of the car. So they make their money where? Not so much in the sale of the car, in the spare parts. That's the whole story. That's it. That's the trick. So it's deception. It's about deception. So this is why trade is that type of a profession. Prophet Muhammad spoke about it in that way. So for us as Muslims, studying in this institution, gaining useful knowledge, graduating and applying that knowledge in society, benefiting people. In doing so, we will be worshiping Allah. We will be fulfilling the command which Allah said in the Quran, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Say, indeed, my prayers, my sacrifices, my living and my dying are for Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. That is the motto of the believer. The whole of life is for Allah, should be for Allah. Meaning that we should be conscious of Allah in all aspects of our lives. We are Muslims first. Whether we are parents, whether we are children, whether we are relatives, whether we are managers, whatever position we are in, we are Muslims first. So this is the message, basically, that I wanted to share with you this evening. One, in that we should be conscious of our role, our position here in this institution is one in which we are worshipping Allah, one in which we will gain beneficial knowledge, beneficial to ourselves and should be beneficial to the society, and also that we have a duty to serve the society that even if we graduate as professionals, we should take some time out and help the needy voluntarily. People who could not afford our services. We work in various medical uh, health related offices or businesses, etc. Know that the mass of people may not have access to this. So it means once a week, or once a month, or once every two months, whatever, we take out some time and we practice our profession freely for the poor. This is the zakah of our knowledge. We share it. We train and teach others to be able to help themselves. And we serve others in ways in which they cannot help themselves. We have that knowledge, we have the skills, we do it for them. This is the way we should be thinking. In this way, then we live blessed lives. Lives which will ultimately end up in paradise, inshallah. But if we choose the other way, the materialist way, the way which is focused on 
gathering as much of the things of this world as is possible, if that becomes our way, then know that our life will be wretched. Know that our life will be wretched. Allah describes those who live that life saying, Hum kal an'am, bal hum adams. They are like cattle. In fact, they're even more astray. They eat, they procreate, they die. That's the life of the cattle. So we have to decide, is that what we want for ourselves? Lives of cattle, the animals? Or is there a greater purpose for which we were created? So, with those thoughts, inshallah, I am concluding my presentation and we'll shift over to the next segment of the program, which I believe will be a Q&A segment, inshallah, um, where if you have written down questions, you can pass them to the front. If you haven't written down, we have some microphone here, you can come down and speak on it. Or if your voice can be heard from where you are, you can stand and express yourself. I said, in terms of Muslims being required to seek knowledge, of course, the first level of knowledge that we're required to seek is knowledge of Allah. Know that that is the most important knowledge that any human being can seek. Knowledge of Allah. Because the importance of an area of knowledge or a subject to seek is determined by the importance of its content. And what is more important than Allah? So this is the beginning of knowledge, knowing Allah. It is what Allah gave us before we entered this world, as mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf. When Allah said He created Adam and took from Adam all of His descendants and He made them bear witness. Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? And we all answered, Bala shahidna. We, yes, we bear witness. You are our Lord. That is the most important question. And that is the first question that we will be asked in the grave. When Munkar and Nakir come to us in the state of the grave, in the state of the Barza, the question, first question that will be asked is, Man Rabbu, who was your Lord? So, knowledge of Allah is the most important knowledge we need to have in this life. Then, knowledge of Islam and knowledge of Rasulullah who lived Islam. So each and every one of you, regardless of what your area of specialization may be, know that it is a requirement on you to learn about Islam. Islam cannot be inherited. <coughs> Yes, your name can be inherited. Your nationality can be inherited. Property can be inherited. But Islam cannot be inherited. They may put it on your passport. They may put it on your ID. But that doesn't mean that you are what is written there. Because Islam is submission of human will, the human soul, to Allah. Can you inherit that from your parents? No. You can't. So it means 
each and every one of us has to make that decision ourselves to submit to Allah. So, Alhamdulillah, I have uh, set up a university online called the Islamic Online University. And the courses, diploma courses in it are 110% free. <laughs> no hidden costs. No deception. 110% free. So I advise you to access the university and take uh, benefit from those courses and learn about your deen. If you want to go into it more deeply, then we have also a BA program in Islamic Studies, which is being linked to the University of the Gambia. Courses are accredited and they're all online. The cost for one semester is $40. For a BA degree, it's $320. What do you think about that? The cheapest BA in the world. So, for those who want to study in more depth, you are free to join the BA courses. Take as many as you wish or as few as you wish, or as the time can handle, it's there. Registration is going on now, and the registration will end for this semester by the end of this month, the end of March. You can pay your $40 if you decide to join the BA at the Islamic Bank. Agib, A-G-I-B, Bank, they're accepting student fees. We have some brochures. Uh, which those who are actually interested in joining, not those who just want a piece of paper to scribble on, uh, but you're interested in actually joining, don't pass it around to each and everybody, please. Only those people who are actually interested in joining, you put your hand up and it will be given to you. Okay, on to our questions. That's the fund that we forget in our introduction. The Sheikh Ronan Online Islamic University. And Islamic Online University, www.islamiconlineuniversity.com. Or you can have the link from his website, drblarbrick.com. So that's an addition. Uh, Sheikh, we have this question here. Uh, this guy is asking. When you have a gastric a reflux, small, while praying, and you swallow it, does it spoil your face? No, it doesn't. <laughs> Can you have this? When I put this thing up, um, I will turn it up now because I think they are more relevant. That's a pretty question, I'm fine. Is it possible for a man to study gynecology just to have, just to help in case of emergency? As we said in the very beginning, if you study medicine, you will study gynecology. But what we talked about is someone who specializes in gynecology, meaning that's what you are going to be doing throughout your working life. Asking women to take off their clothes and lie on a bed in front of you. This is not appropriate. Uh, this question is a bit unclear, but I will read it anyway. What is the Islamic judgment of using an inappropriate knowledge as explained to save life? What is the Islamic judgment of saving life while it is time to worship that is praise? We know that where life is threatened, saving lives, we are permitted to do things that are normally impermissible. If you're starving to death, 
And the only food that is available is pork. You eat it. You eat what is enough to keep you alive. You don't now start to feast and have a pork festival, right? You just eat what is enough to keep you alive. So, this is a basic principle that we have in Islam, that where necessity, in order to save life, arises, then what is normally impermissible can become permissible. Ad-Dururat, Tubih, al mahdurat Okay, uh, shall we continue with this question? What is the ruling of Islam on autopsy or postmortem? Where it is necessary, it should be done. Where it is not necessary, it should not be an automatic practice. Where evidence indicates foul play, something is off, wrong, then it may be done. But just to say as a routine procedure, anybody who's dead, you're cutting them open, no. Okay, another question. In one practice as a health worker, a patient happened to die because he gave, I think, the wrong dose of drug and forget to give a drug, forget to give a drug, uh, I think he meant to say the right drug. Is this sinful as a model? Is this? Where one gives uh, wrong amounts or wrong dosages of medicine as a result of accident, then they're not held accountable. Islamically, they're not held accountable in the sight of the law in terms of having committed murder, caused somebody's death. So, they may be excused, though according to Islamic law, what is known as dia may still be applicable because they did cause that person's death. They would not be executed for having caused that person's death, but they would have to pay a fine for having caused that person's death accidentally. If the relatives of that person insist on their pain. Uh, uh, I think that's correct. Salam Chef, what is your advice to a female medical practitioner who wants to put on nikah, the nikah? Uh, yeah, the female medical practitioner who wants to put on the nikah, what is your advice? For wearing a nikah, shouldn't uh, prevent one from practicing their profession. Uh, if, however, one finds oneself in a situation where the institution in which they're working insists that they do not wear niqab, then they weigh, at that point, what is the benefit and the harm, and if they conclude that the benefit is greater than the harm, then they remove the niqab and practice their profession. Uh, this question goes up. Is it right for a Muslim girl at the stage of Peabody to go to Juma prayers? For Juma prayers. Is it permissible? Yeah, is it right. Is it I right? Is it permissible? Is it permissible? Of course it's permissible. Before puberty or after puberty? Um, at puberty, at the stage of puberty. But I'm saying yes, whether I'm she even before puberty or after puberty is permissible. Yeah. Going to Juma uh, is permissible. It's permissible. I think maybe the menstruation has Oh, if you have issues of menstruation, then that's another issue. Uh, if they attend but stay away from the prayer area, it's permissible. Prophet had told even women who were on their menses to join the Eid prayer. 
not the actual prayer, but they participate in the gathering, but they were told to stay back from the prayer area. That's sufficient. Uh, this question goes as a Muslim brother at a health facility where there is no nurse but him. I think he meant to say himself. There is the only one nurse. And a woman came to labor. What is the Islamic ruling on this? He does what he has to do. <laughs> This question is related to the one just above. Is it allowed or permissible for a woman to read the Quran during the menses? This is asked. Is it allowed for women to read the Quran during the menses? Menstruation. To recite Quran in the state of menses is permissible. Yes. Is there, if uh, this one asks, is female circumcision accepted in Islam? Female circumcision is accepted where it is similar to male circumcision. In other words, skin is removed but organs are not removed. So the practice in many countries, unfortunately, where women's body parts are cut out, this is evil and Islam is completely against it. But where it is only removing a small amount of skin, similar to the removal of the skin for the male in his circumcision, it is permissible. I think that's clear. Uh, the next uh, question is, when a Muslim drinks alcohol and knows that alcohol, and knows that it is an alcohol, what is the punishment on that Muslim? I think he's asking for a Muslim drinking alcohol. What is the punishment for a Muslim drinking alcohol? <laughs> For, a per for a Muslim who drinks alcohol, it affects his prayers, the acceptability of his prayers. Uh, according to Islamic law, he will be lashed, the hand from Islamic law. And in the next life, the Prophet ﷺ described people being punished in the hellfire in particular ways as a result of having drunken alcohol in this life. So, it is all around evil. The punishments according to Islamic law are severe. And the harm that comes to the individual causing his own death or the death of others is well known for even those who don't uh, accept Islam and Islam's ruling with regard to alcohol. Okay, this is the last question we have and then we will go for the word of time. Uh, can, a move, can a male not specialize in midwife? This is the same story that we talked about earlier. For a male nurse to become a midwife, and I invite like they call her midwife. <laughs> This is something inappropriate. They will learn as a nurse all conditions to deal with all conditions. So if an emergency arises and there is no female available, then they may do what is required. But to say that becomes their profession, it is not appropriate. All right. Uh, so we have an adjustment to a question earlier asked is that he meant to say if it is okay for the woman to hold the Quran during menstruation. I think he's asking. Now, holding the Quran, again, if we're talking about the all Arabic Quran, the Mus'haf, which the Prophet Muhammad had specified should not be held.
held by one who is not uh, in a state of purity, then we say no. If it is a mixture of Quran and other than Quran, then it is permissible. If they have like a translation, Arabic, English, for example, it is permissible because it's no longer classified officially as Quran. So, thank you very much, Chef for those answers. And we now give the SIS press the SIS. I have a question. Oh, you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Just ask. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, this uh, statement about we being an um, an Ummah which does which doesn't calculate, this is not authentic. Uh, we know historically Muslims have calculated. Uh, we have so many aspects of our uh, life involving calculation, whether it is the five times daily prayer, the times for the five times daily prayer, the fasting, the month, when the month begins, when it ends, what to do if the days are short or if it's long. And we have all of this. And even the well-known hadith of the time of the Dajjal, when the Prophet had said that the first day in the reign of the Dajjal will be equivalent to one year. The Sahaba asked the Prophet how will we find out or know when to pray? He said, Qaddirula, estimate it. You have to estimate by calculation. So this claim that uh, calculation is not uh, a part of Islamic tradition is totally wrong. Mathematics being one of the fields that Muslims contributed perhaps the most of all the various sciences. So that's totally off. Uh, what we have right now is a situation uh, where madrasas were developed at a time in order to protect Muslims from conversion to Christianity. From the time of the missionary activities, madrasas became means of protecting the children. They served a purpose in the past, but actually today Muslims need to relook at the madrasa system and identify what really are the goals of that system and now readjust them to match the goals that are needed for the 21st century. The reality is that the madrasa right now is producing cripples. They're crippling the students. They're coming out from the madrasas with no future. They estimate approximately 30,000 students graduate from madrasas every year here in the Gambia alone. Of that 30,000, less than 50 find places in Arab or Arabic universities in the Middle East. And less than 100 find jobs in madrasas. So we're left with 29,850 who have nothing. They have to now go back to grade six, start their grade seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, over again in order to have sufficient English-based knowledge to be able to further their education. And that's few among them. The vast majority don't manage to do that, so they become lost to society. They become the lost generation. This is the legacy of today's madrasa. And that's why it does need to be revamped, modified, so that it serves the needs of the community of Muslims in Gambia. The introduction of four subjects into the madrasa syllabus is the beginning. But it's not the end. It is the beginning. But even that beginning needs a lot of help because I know from talking with different schools that even those four subjects introduced are not treated seriously. The teachers who are teaching are not qualified. So even though they have these four subjects and they graduate, they cannot compete with 
the graduates from the missionary school. So we still have a long way to go. Sorry, what is the ruling on people, Islamic, or sorry, Muslims in particular, who hate the symbols of Islam? Because we have, uh, I have encountered so many who tend to hate the symbols of Islam, for example, the niqab and the other uh, ISIS, the beard and the In terms of ruling, you know, when you ask, what is the ruling on ignorance? You know, obviously, any Muslim who despises the outer appearances of Islam must be ignorant. He or she must be ignorant. So, the ruling on Islam for ignorance is what? It's a disease. Its cure is what? Knowledge. So, the ruling is that such people should be educated, should be taught. And this is part of Dawah, that when we find people making these kinds of expressions, we try to help them. We don't just reject them and say, okay, brother, you're now a kafir. What you just said made you a kafir. You're going to help. Now, is that going to help him understand what was wrong about what he said? No. So we have to use wisdom, as Allah said, Udru ila sabili rabbika bil hikma wal ma'idat al hasana. Call to the way of your Lord with wisdom and fair preaching. Maybe the discovery of Hanky Wisdom whatsoever. Um, in a book written by Abu Hassan al Nadawi, it says, Mada Hassan al Alam bin Hutati Muslimin, what the world has learned since the decline of Islam or Muslims. He made mention a clear criticism that there has not been any form of renewal, or rather of a um, renewal of the oral sciences. They have just been copied on over and over. And as such, some people like, for example, the study of philosophy in other countries like Saudi Arabia is not encouraged. And it is the basis of which most of these sciences that we talk about today revolve. We will make a state law like mathematics, for example, in our Arabic schools here, people don't take mathematics. They cannot even do mirrors. Most of the people, they run away from it because they cannot do mathematics. Um, okay, but get to your question. Yeah, get to your question. Okay. What is your question? question? Okay, my question was, what encouragement would you give to people of that concept? Because they say, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, we are a nation that doesn't calculate. Umbatullah Nasi. For example, regarding the finding of the Hilal, it doesn't mean calculation. So some people hated mathematics because of that. Even if a teacher comes into this class for mathematics, Okay. Uh, the, this uh, statement about we being an, um, an Ummah which does, which doesn't calculate, this is not authentic. Uh, we know historically Muslims have calculated. Uh, we have so many aspects of our uh, life involving calculation whether it is the five times daily prayer, the times for the five times daily prayer, the fasting, the month, when the month begins, when it ends, what to do if the days are short or if it's long. And we have all of this. And even the well-known hadith of the time of the job, when the Prophet ﷺ had said that the first day in the reign of the job will be equivalent to one year. The Sahaba asked the Prophet ﷺ, how will we find out or know when to pray? He said, Adirullah, estimate it. You have to estimate by calculation. So this claim that uh, calculation is not uh, a part of Islamic tradition is totally wrong. Mathematics being one of the fields that Muslims contributed perhaps the most of all the various sciences. So that's totally off. Uh, what we have right now is a situation uh, where madrasas were developed at a time in order to protect Muslims from conversion to Christianity. From the time of the missionary activities, Madrasas became means of protecting the children, 
They served their purpose in the past. But actually, today, Muslims need to relook at the madrasa system and identify what really are the goals of that system. And now readjust them to match the goals that are needed for the 21st century. The reality is that the madrasa right now is producing cripples. They're crippling the students. They're coming out from the madrasas with no future. They estimate approximately 30,000 students graduate from madrasas every year here in the Gambia alone. Of that 30,000, less than 50 find places in Arab or Arabic universities in the Middle East. And less than 100 find jobs in madrasas. So we're left with 29,850 who have nothing. They have to now go back to grade 6, start their grade 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, over again in order to have sufficient English-based knowledge to be able to further their education. And that's few among them. The vast majority don't manage to do that, so they become lost to society. They become the lost generation. This is the legacy of today's madrasa. And that's why it does need to be revamped, modified, so that it serves the needs of the community of Muslims in Gambia. The introduction of four subjects into the madrasa syllabus is the beginning. But it's not the end. It is the beginning. But even that beginning needs a lot of help because I know from talking with different schools that even those four subjects introduced are not treated seriously. The teachers who are teaching are not qualified. So even though they have these four subjects and they graduate, they cannot compete with the graduates from the missionary schools. So we still have a long way to go. At least, uh, not a word of thanks, I wouldn't call it a word of thanks, but uh, appreciation, the statement of appreciation of the chef coming to honor this invitation. So we would like to invite the uh, brother to come and give us a statement of appreciation of uh, the chef honoring uh, this dawah invitation. I feel very honored, privileged, and yet very humbled to be chosen to give the vote of thanks in that I wish to extend on behalf of the School of Nursing, the School of Medicine, and the entire uh, medical fraternity our heartfelt appreciation and gratefulness in gracing this important event, having to share with us what uh, us can tell us that's the risk, that's the knowledge of the thing, inshallah. Your words have been very inspiring, and uh, I believe that will go a long way uh, in having effects in the life we live. Uh, this garden reminds me of a post that I read just some time ago uh, from the net, and it quotes, unquote, how much of Islam do you learn or know? And it asks its readers also, how much of what you know do you share with others? and how much of what you know and share do you really practice? Uh, I believe this platform really creates that uh, avenue for us to uh, learn from each other and share in the, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just as the Prophet said, convey my message even if it's going to be one eye. We thank you once more, Sheikh. And finally, I thank the participation of uh, School of uh, uh, Public Health, that is Bukama Pams, Campus. CISA and University Islamic Association for their contribution and uh, participation. Thank you all. Up now, and uh, we extend our salams uh, to all of us here. And the appreciation, obviously, this is a very special moment for all of us.
and the chef we know him in Tawa around the world, so we can uh, the videos I think will be available to some of them. I'm not sure how big, uh, how quick will that be, but at least to disseminate the message and also to uh, extend the, the, the knowledge of to other people that the chef is here in the Gambia and people at least can benefit during his time here in this country and also to use the resources that the chef is providing for at the internet in particular and the University of the Gambia now, which is uh, some some very very positive development to the Islamic education in this country. Um, we, on that note, we would like to wrap up and thank the brothers of CISA very much for inviting us and also for giving us the opportunity to, to, to be here with the chef. It's a very privileged moment for us in particular. So we thank you all and uh, we say so assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.